So this is the overall view of our first Lonzo Meadows test. What we have done is we've positioned the smelter pretty much in the dead center of our space. We've estimated the size of the smelter on a 20 centimeter internal diameter with walls about five centimeters thick, which gives us a total size of 30 centimeters. And uh, we have used the large tub to mark the position where the shallow pit is in the original excavation. Uh, there are a number of questions about what that pit actually might represent. In this configuration, we're suggesting the possibility that it represents a standing pit for the bellows operator himself, probably revetted. And you can see that we've laid out our space inside of approximately a three by three meter area, which just through lucky circumstance is pretty much the same size as our little smelting area here in Wareham. Of course, one of the most interesting things, we'll be looking at the debris pattern that occurs as we actually work inside of this space. At this point in our smelt, We've just started a low air preheat. At this point, we've been using wood splints to dry out the smelter for a little over two hours. We figure we'll be adding charcoal at about the two and a half hour preheat mark. So the problem with working with a straight clay as opposed to a clay cob is that any moisture that's left inside of the structure as it approaches smelting temperature causes the clay to spall off. The water flashes to its steam, expands, and explodes. Now this particular smelter has just had its full load of charcoal added. Charcoal's only been in there for five minutes. The full charcoal column is not ignited yet. But you can see how the material is splattering off the external surface. Our concern is that if these spallings get too large, we may actually blow a hole right into the furnace itself. This is the morning after the smelt. You can see the debris from the smelter largely torn apart from the extraction in the center of the working space. 
most of the larger pieces would of course be cleared away if there was going to be any attempt to do further work inside of this, the smelter space. The circle of clay that forms the base of the smelter might be retained to use as the walls of a forge for further consolidation and manipulation of um, the bloom into bar and the bars into finished objects. You can see the space marked by the metal drum is where the ore had been placed and there's a small spray of ore on the ground around the base of that drum. Closest to us there's a spray of charcoal that extends from the smelter base in this case towards what would have been the west side of the smelter in the Lanza Meadows dig. We suspect that that spray of charcoal mixed with partially sintered ore was actually the tongue that on the archaeological drawings extends towards the east, towards the open door. Quite purposefully, while Ken was doing the extraction process and clearing the debris out of the center of the smelter, he dumped the material on what would be for him as a right-hander the awkward side instead of the normal side. Normally that spray of material would in fact be located on the opposite side of the smelter from where you see it right now. Now we're standing in what at Lanza Meadows would have been the open side of the building. What you can see is the self-tapping of slag through a crack in the base of the furnace. What may be of interest is the way this dark tap slag has wrapped around the two sides of the circular shape of the smelter. This would leave a quite clear half circle impression on the base of the smelter on the ground. If in fact we were to work this area as a forge, we wouldn't necessarily have to actually scoop that debris out of the way. Of course, the larger pieces of uh, broken up wall, what was called bare in the archaeological report, some of that material would remain, but the bigger pieces would have to be cleared away. Um, in the archaeological drawing, though, you see a very clear half circular impression in the charcoal and slag debris.